All right, welcome back to the fifth clip in chapter 13. Yeah, we were looking at computing the variance and side deviation for the portfolio. Okay, uh, please note that the standard, the variance and standard deviation yeah, for the portfolio is much lower okay, than the variance and standard deviation of the individual assets. Yeah? Now let's look at take a look at the expected return. Yeah, you find that the expected return is 9.5%. Okay, which is between these two, yeah, it cannot be higher than the higher, yeah, it cannot be higher than 13, and it cannot be lower than 6%, yeah, why? Because it's a weighted average of the expected return of these two, yeah. Remember, 9.5% you can compute this way, yeah, 0 0.4 multiplied by 12.5% plus 0 0.6, sorry, 0 0.6 multiplied by 7.5%, yeah, you get 9.5%. Another way of computing this, as we have seen earlier, is to take 0 0.5 because you invest 50% uh, of your money in stock A, you multiply with 6%, which is the expected return for stock A. Yeah? 0 0.5 multiplied by 6 plus 0 0.5 multiplied by 13, you get exactly 9.5%. Yeah? The same method. Yeah? Okay, so you have two measures. Yeah, I've, I've computed that here. Okay, there are two ways of computing this. Yeah, once. Uh, the same method or, or the first method is you use the possible return for the portfolio then you multiply this with the probability of the possibility yeah? this multiplied by this plus this multiplied by this you get 9.5 percent that's one way that's the way of computing the expected return for individual stocks as well as the portfolio yeah? now the second method of computing the expected return for the portfolio is to take the weight, yeah, portfolio weight for each stock, then multiply with the expected return for each stock. So 0 0.5 multiplied by 6 plus 0 0.5 multiplied by 13, you get 9.5, which is the same, same answer, and yeah, these two. It must be the same, yeah, because it's based on the same principle, all right? Now, so therefore, you find that the expected return is always in between, yeah? Uh, the highest component stocks expected return and the lowest component stocks expected return. It cannot be higher or lower than these two. Yeah? But when you look at the variance, you find that this one has higher variance. This has higher standard deviation compared to this. Yeah? All right? But the variance of the portfolio and the standard deviation of the portfolio is lower than both. Okay, In this case, it's lower. Yeah? Why is that? Why why can that be? Eh? Even though it's made up of these two stocks, okay, but the variance is lower than these two, yeah, and also the standard deviation lower than these two. Why is that? This is because of the nature of the return. Yeah, so the expected return cannot be lower, okay, than this, and cannot be higher than this for the portfolio. But the variance of the portfolio or the standard deviation of the portfolio can be, yeah. It is not always, but it can be lower than the lowest, yeah? But it cannot be higher than the highest, yeah? It cannot be higher than this, but it can be lower than the lowest, yeah? The component stock that has the lowest standard deviation of variance, okay? The portfolio variance can be lower than this. And in this case, it's lower. Why is it lower? This is a unique case or a very special case, yeah? Where the returns are... Uh, opposite to one another, they move in opposite direction. Yeah? For example, stock A, when there is a boom, stock A gives you high return, but stock B gives you low return, yeah? negative return. But when there is bust, stock A gives you negative return, but stock B gives you high return. Yeah? So these two stocks are uh, negatively correlated, we call this correlation. Yeah? This, the returns of stock A and stock B are negatively correlated. So therefore, the return of one yeah, will offset the return of the other. Okay, for example, when there is a bust for stock, uh, there's, there's a boom, stock B falls, yeah, the, the return falls, but stock A uh, goes up. Therefore, this compensates for that. Okay, and when there is a bust, stock A goes down, but stock B goes up. So this compensates for that. Therefore, you find that whatever happens, the portfolio's return is more or less stable yeah? or more stable compared to the stocks. Okay, Once it is 30%, then the other time it's negative 10. Yeah? So, quite huge difference. Here it's negative 5, but then here it's 25. Yeah? Quite huge difference. But here it's 12.5 and 7.5. 
There is a difference, but the difference is smaller. Yeah? Okay. Therefore, the variance is lower and the standard deviation is lower as well. Yeah? So this is the nature of the portfolio's variance. Yeah? It can be lower. So this is an important uh, concept to understand. It can be lower than the component stops. Standard deviation of variance uh, in the portfolio. Yeah? Component stock in the portfolio. They can have variance, which is high, but the portfolio's variance can be low. Yeah? Okay, so this is an important point to take note of. Is that okay? All right, yeah. Now let's uh, move on to the uh, go back to the slides. Right, we have computed, yeah, we have co uh, completed this. So let's move on to the next slide. Okay, and this I have explained to you earlier. Now there's this other example here. Yeah? You can look at this another example. I'm not going to go through this yeah, because uh, we have covered this before. Okay, it's just another example of what we have covered. Yeah? But note that this uh, this another example with different portfolio weights. Yeah? With different portfolio weights because here you have 60% you I'm uh, sorry uh, yeah 60% in asset X and 40% in asset Z. Okay, so there are two assets here, yeah. So you need to compute the uh, possible returns for the portfolio. Then you have to compute the expected return and the standard deviation for the portfolio, yeah. So you can try this on your own, yeah. The only difference is that you have different weights and more possibilities. Just now you have only two possibilities: boom and bust. Here you have boom, normal, and recession. Okay, you can have more states actually, yeah, but. No matter how many states you have, the method that you use to compute the standard deviation and yeah, the, the expected return and the standard deviation is the same. Yeah? So you can try it on your own. Alright, let's move on to the next slide. Okay, now we move to the third uh, part yeah, of this chapter, which is diversification and risk components. Yeah? Alright, so here, let me just... Uh, Alright, and we look at expected and unexpected returns. We look at the returns. Yeah? We take a step back and look at returns. Yeah? Now, realized returns are generally not equal to expected returns. Yeah? When we say realized, these are actually uh, uh, expected returns. Okay? Realized returns are generally not equal. It means that realized return is equal to expected return plus unexpected return. Yeah? Because there is an uh, expected component and an unexpected component. There are two components. Okay, so the realized can be higher than the expected or it can be lower. Yeah? So this unexpected can be uh, positive or it can be negative. Yeah? At any point in time, the unexpected return can be either positive or negative, as I mentioned here. Okay, But over time, the average of the expected component is zero. This average is zero. Yeah? Therefore, we can say that the average unexpected return is zero. So, average realized return yeah, will be equal to average expected return. So, this average here must be the average of these two, right? Now, this average of unexpected return is zero in the long run. Yeah? Over time, the average of the unexpected component here must be zero. Sometimes it's higher, sometimes it's lower, meaning expected yeah the unexpected return can be positive sometimes it's negative but over time okay the average of the unexpected return must be zero okay and therefore the average of the realized return must be equal to the average of the expected return yeah? so that's the basic underlying principle we use in forecasting yeah? when we forecast any numbers we use this principle all right now we look at announcements and news, yeah, because this relates to the return. Yeah? Announcements and news contain both expected components and a surprise component. Surprise here means unexpected. Okay, surprise is always unexpected. Yeah? Now it is the surprise component that affects a stock's price and therefore its return. Yeah? Price can change only due to an unexpected change in a factor now or in the future. Okay, yeah, if there is a change, now change yeah, can be arising from two, yeah, uh, two types of change. Yeah? One is expected change, the other is unexpected change. Now, if there is an expected change, okay, the price, when you say price, price here means the price of securities or assets or stocks. Okay, this stock's price will not change, yeah, why? Because 
the change in the factor is expected. Okay, when you determine a price of a stock, okay, you consider what are the likely changes in these factors. Yeah? The expected changes have been considered and then this determines the price of the stock. Okay, when the price of the stock changes, this must be due to unexpected change, not due to expected changes. Is that okay? This is an important uh, principle to understand. Yeah? So this is very obvious when we watch how stock prices move, when an unexpected announcement is made or earnings are different from anticipated. So when there is a difference, then the price will change. Yeah. When the market feels okay, that the news or the change is positive, then the price will go up. Go up yeah? But if the market feels that the change is a negative news, meaning it is not very favorable for the particular stock, then the price of the stock will fall. Yeah? So it's that simple principle yeah, that is applied here. All right, let's look at efficient markets. Yeah? Efficient markets are a result of investors trading on the unexpected portion of the announcements. That means surprise elements. If there's a surprise element and the market, yeah, the investors or the owners of stocks, yeah, what they can do is they can buy or sell the stock based on these announcements, these surprise elements. Yeah? So the easier it is to trade on surprises, the more efficient the market will be. Okay, so if it's easy to trade, if for example, there's a, a new news about a particular stock, okay, that relates to a particular stock, then the investors can easily buy or sell the stock. If, let's say, the news is good, then people will want to buy, yeah? So if they can buy, easily buy up the stocks, then the price will go up, yeah? So that means efficient, yeah, efficient market. <coughs> if, let's say, there is this news, but then uh, you cannot buy or sell the stocks quickly enough, yeah? Then the market is called inefficient, not efficient, yeah? So efficient markets involve random price changes, yeah? Because we cannot predict surprises. Efficient market does not mean that the price will remain stable, no, yeah? The prices will change, but the prices change due to uh, incoming surprises, yeah? There will always be surprises in the market, yeah? Because there is always unexpected changes okay when this unexpected changes occur then the prices must change quickly if the prices change quickly the, the price of stocks change quickly then it's an efficient market but if let's say the surprises happen and the prices take a long time to change then the market is not efficient okay so that's the idea behind this yeah? efficient or inefficient is how quickly the prices change due to surprises if they change very slowly, then we can call this an inefficient market. If it changes very quickly to surprises, then it's an efficient market. It does not mean that the market uh, will have prices that do not change. Then only it's efficient. No, yeah? that's a misconception. Is that okay? All right. Let's move on to uh, the next slide. Yeah. Now with that information or knowledge, okay, we look. We have a relook yeah, at the return. Yeah. Now the total return is made up of expected return and unexpected return. We have seen this before. Eh? We've seen that as realized return okay, or actual return. But it's the same thing as total return. Eh? Now total return is for a particular stock at a particular time. Yeah? So this expected return okay, plus unexpected return will be your actual return. Yeah? We use actual rather than total here. Yeah? Now the unexpected return Okay, this unexpected return is made up of two components. Yeah? One is called systematic portion and the other is unsystematic portion. Yeah? For the moment, let's just take these two. You yeah? can divide this into two. Okay? This is called the total risk and this total risk, okay, this is the unexpected return. We have, we have computed the unexpected return. Yeah? Not unexpected return but the volatility of the return. Yeah? And this volatility of return, we can call this the risk. Okay, and this risk can be divided into two portions. Yeah? One is non-diversifiable, the other is diversifiable. Now, this diversifiable is called unsystematic, yeah? and the non-diversifiable is called systematic. You know this, yeah? this, this, is, this is systematic, but it's non-diversifiable. This is diversifiable, it is unsystematic. Yeah? Don't confuse, yeah? unsystematic is not 
non-diversity.